Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church of St. Paul. We are located in Maramirai, Minnesota. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing is a beloved hymn written in 1758 by Robert Robinson. When he was a young boy, he lost his father and they had lived a very, very difficult life. And when he was a teenager, he got into trouble hanging out with the gangs. And, um, but when, we went, when he went to a revival meeting with his friends, um, he decided he wanted to turn his life around to become a preacher. Um, later on in life, he also had a moment where he was so um, disconnected and felt like his he was wandering off from Christianity when he met a young woman on the train singing this hymn to him and he realized that it was a hymn that he had written usually the fourth stanza was omitted but this time I'd like to include it. Please sing along. Good morning. Welcome to First Christian Church. Uh, my name is Dennis Sanders. I am the lead pastor here. First Christian Church of St. Paul is located in Matamidi, Minnesota. We are a congregation of the Christian Church, Disciples of Christ. If you'd like to know more about our church or our denomination, please go to our church website at fccstpaul.org. This is um, our Sunday worship service. We are glad to have you join us here on uh, this Sunday morning as we come together to worship God. We are a congregation that is centered in Christ and have as our values diversity, fellowship, and witness. 
Today is the fourth Sunday after Pentecost. We are continuing in our sermon series on the book of Romans. A few announcements before we begin. I want to say thank you to those who took part in our um, game night on Thursday night. Um, it was a good time had by all, and we would love to have you there again. We will be um, planning on having one again in the near future. Also, um, for those who are interested, we do have a coffee hour after the worship service. Um, usually this service runs live at 10 a.m. on Sunday, and at 11 a.m. we gather on Zoom for our um, weekly time. And so um, you will find the, the web address to log on somewhere um, on this broadcast that will have that address, and we would love to have you join us. And then also on Wednesdays, we would love to have you join us on Wednesday evenings at 5.30 p.m. Central Time when we gather for our midweek Vespers. And this is a time that we gather, we lift up prayers of the community, um, prayers within our own faith community here at First Christian Church of St. Paul, and also we lift up um, your prayers. And so if you have a prayer that you would like to for us to share, please email it to us at info at fccstpaul.org. With that, let us begin worship. Oh God, your never failing providence sets in order all things both in heaven and on earth. Put away from us all hurtful things and give us those things that are profitable for us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And let us take part in the call to worship. We are called together this day to praise God. And let us together say, we ask that God will put us in pathways to service to others. Lord, the Lord will walk with us as we faithfully witness to Christ's love. And let us together say, open our hearts, Lord, to receive your words and will. Come, Lord, come and let us worship God. And together we say, let us sing our praises to God, our Redeemer and our Healer. And now let us take part in our confession and forgiveness. Patient Lord, we want to extend the hand of welcome and friendship to all whom we meet, but we know that sometimes we shy away from reaching out. We make judgment about others based on their appearance or, their surface or other surface factors. We neglect your mandate to be a welcoming presence. That lack of welcome extends further when we see the needs that must be addressed and choose to turn our backs. We turn away from the pain and suffering to protect our own lives. Yet you remind us that as we welcome others, so we also are welcoming you. Heal us and give us strength and courage to always be welcoming others in your name. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, a reading from Romans chapter 6, verses 12 through 23. Now let us attend to God's wisdom. That means that you must not give sin a vote in the way you conduct your lives. Don't give it the time of day. Don't even run little errands that are connected to the old way of life. Throw yourselves wholeheartedly and full-time. Remember, you have been raised from the dead into God's way of doing things. Sin can't tell you how to live. After all, you're not living under that old tyranny any longer. You're living in the freedom of God. So, since we're out from under that old tyranny, does that mean we can live any old way we want since we are free in the freedom of God 
can we do anything that comes to mind? Hardly. You know well enough from your own experience that there are some acts of so-called freedom that destroy freedom. Offer yourself sin to sin, for instance, and that's the last free act. But offer yourselves to the ways of God and that freedom never quits. All your lives you've let sin tell you what to do, but thank God you've started listening to a new master, one whose commands set you free to live openly into his freedom. I'm using the freedom language here because it is easy to picture. You can readily recall, can't you, how at one time the more you did just what you felt like doing, not caring about others, not caring about God, the worse your life became, the less freedom you had. And how much different is it now as you live in God's freedom? Your, your lives healed and expanse in holiness? As long as you did what you felt like doing, ignoring God, you didn't have to bother with right thinking or right living or right anything for that matter. But do you call that a free life? What you did, you got out of it? Nothing you're proud of now. Where did it get you? a dead end. But now that you have found you don't have to listen to sin tell you what to do and discovered the delight of listening to God telling you, what a surprise! A whole healed, put together life right now with more and more life on the way. Work hard for sin your whole life your prevention will be death. But God's gift is real life, eternal life, delivered by Jesus, our Master. This ends this reading of this, His Holy Word. May it be good news to us. So I remember it like it was yesterday. It was the summer of 1988. And I can remember that year for any, and for any of you who were alive at that time, that was an incredibly hot summer. I was still back home in my home state of Michigan. And this was maybe the first time, at least in my memory, that we had several days that were above 100 degrees. And I just, for some reason, that, that summer just lives in my memory because of that. But I'm not really here to talk about the weather today. What I want to talk about right now is voting. In October of the year prior, I turned 18, which meant that I could vote. Um, I had already voted in my first election. That was for the mayor of Flint, Michigan, where I grew up. And I was getting ready for the upcoming presidential election that year. I was incredibly ready to vote in that election. But the local election, especially maybe like a school board election, not so much. I was home. This was my first year of college had just been completed, so I was now home. And like I said, there were some school board elections happening that year, and I had zero interest in them. Didn't care, was not interested. I was gonna sit this one out. I can remember that my mother was getting ready to go vote. And it wasn't a long way to go voting. You just kind of went somewhere across the street to the church 
and that's where our precinct was. And she was getting ready and she asked me if I had voted. And I responded, no. And it was in that way, in that voice that could tell you, I had no intention of doing that, doing so. And that was the wrong answer to give my mother. She told me to get ready and to come along with her to vote. And for most of you who are aware of this, you will know that my mother is not someone that you want to say no to. So I went along with her and vote. I did not really want to vote. Wasn't interested, still didn't have very much interest. In, but for her, it was important and it was necessary. She believed, and still does, that it is always important to vote and to not take that right for granted. She believed especially that as citizens in a democracy, that is our obligation to vote, to vote for candidates who will lead us, who will represent us. And even more so, one of the things that made her want to vote is that people had fought and died, maybe only 20 years prior, to secure that African Americans would be able to vote without intimidation. So I was obligated because of others who sacrificed and because of being a citizen in a democracy. In a country where we love to talk about freedom, what my mother was reminding is, us is, is that freedom is not the ability to do whatever you want and not have to worry about anybody else. What freedom was, was about expectations that you needed to live up to. Paul is back today as we continue in our sermon series on the book of Romans, and he is talking about living under sin and also living under grace and what that all means. In Christ, we no longer are captive to sin. We are now under grace. Sin is not what rules in our hearts and in our minds anymore. It is now grace. But just because we are no longer enslaved or in bondage to sin doesn't mean that we can do what we want. It is not the freedom that we have in Christ is not the freedom that we like to think we have in our society, that we as a society like to think is freedom. In our culture, Paul tells us that we actually are not free in the way that we think we are. That in some ways we are servants to somebody. In fact, what Paul says is that we are slaves. That we can either be slaves to evil or slaves to grace. Now, a quick note here before we continue going. I know that when we talk about the and use the word slave, that can have bring up bad connotations, especially in American culture. But the slavery of the Roman Empire was not the same as the slavery that we talk, we talk about in the antebellum South. Slavery here was more of what they would have called indentured servitude, that you put yourself into this time where you are a servant and either you have a debt to pay or what have you that you are able then to buy, get yourself out of that slavery. So just to let you know about that. But here we are a slave. We are bound to those that we are serving. And as a servant or a slave, you have expectations to live up to. You just don't get to do what you want. Being a slave to God, though, God means that we choose to be bound to God. We ask that God take over our lives, 
and mold us day by day into the likeness of Christ. Now, there is the big word that we like to use when we are talking about what it means to become Christ-like, to be in a process of becoming like Christ. And that word is sanctification. It is the process that we are changed each day into the likeness of Christ. When it comes to the church at Rome or the church in Matamidi, the question we must always face is, how is God's spirit changing us? Are we living up to the expectations of faith? Are we realizing that the faith that we have, the freedom that we have in Christ, is also something that demands something from us? Sometimes we are tempted to come to church because it's comfortable. We love to come to meet our friends, to hear the good, the, the, the hymns, maybe to hear a nice sermon, but we don't really want to think that there's anything more to that. To follow Jesus, though, is to mean that something is required of us. It's something that is demanded of us. We are not simply free to do whatever we please, but in some ways we are called to obey. The expectation is there to be open to the Spirit and to allow the Spirit to change us. Now, expectation does not mean that you must do this. We are free to say no. But if we take our baptism seriously, if we believe that we are no longer under law but under grace, then that means that we must take what Christ has done and take what it means to be a Christian seriously. Now, I want to finish with a quote that I saw this week. It's from a Bible commentary, the book of Acts. You know, when I look at Bible commentaries to prepare for Sunday um, sermons, I don't normally necessarily think that they are, are in that incredibly engaging reading, but this one was kind of like being hit with cold water. You had to stand up, you had to pay attention to it. The quote comes from a theologian, Willie James Jennings, who is a professor at Yale Seminary, and he shared this observation, and he is talking about the book of Acts and talking about sanctification. This is what he says. Where the Spirit of God is, there is a divine desire, not simply for God, but for one another, and not simply for one another, but for those to whom we are sent by the Spirit, to those already being drawn into communion with God and sensing the desire of God for the expansion of their lives into the lives of others. The deepest reality of life in the Spirit depicted in the book of Acts is that the disciples of Jesus rarely, if ever, go where they want to go, to whom they would want to go. Indeed, the Spirit seems to always be pressing the disciples to go to those whom they would, in fact, strongly prefer to never share space or a meal and definitely not life together. Yet, it is precisely this prodding to be boundary crossing and border transgressing that marks the presence of the Spirit of God. We read from the, we had our sermon series last month on the book of Acts, and we did not bring up this passage, but I'm always reminded here, when I think of this text, I'm reminded of Paul, or of Peter, the Apostle Peter, and he was called to share the good news with someone called Cornelius. Cornelius was a Roman soldier. 
he didn't want to go and share the good news with a, to a Roman. But he had an encounter with God and he decided to go and do what God called him to do. Still not sure if this was the wise thing to do. But as he is preaching the good news, the gospel to Cornelius, the Holy Spirit comes down in their presence and Cornelius and all of his household are filled with the Spirit. And Peter understood that this was, this gift of, the, of Jesus was for everyone as the Holy Spirit demonstrated. Sometimes God is going to send us to places that we never dream of going to. But the thing is, and that scares us, but the thing is, if we are in God's spirit, we will feel that desire to cross boundaries. And we will know that God is with us because God doesn't send us alone. Being sanctified tends to imply that we are leaving our comfort zones and going into places that we would have never imagined. Followers of Jesus do not just sit in the pews or in this case behind a computer screen. We also find ways to connect with others. The mission statement of First Christian of St. Paul states that we are an inclusive family of God, creating and inspiring Christian discipleship through fellowship, community mission, and the love of Jesus. We are called by God to inspire others to follow Jesus through our actions, which are empowered by the Holy Spirit. The grace of God is amazing. We are no longer bound by sin. But just like being in a democracy has its expectations, has its demands, so does the church. So let us be open to the proddings of the spirit so that others may come and learn the love and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, please pray with me. 
O oh, good and gracious God, you are the creator and author of life. We give thanks. We give thanks for another day, another day to be the best that we can be. O oh, good and gracious God, yet in the midst of the promise of this day, we see a world so different than the good of your creation. O oh, good and gracious God, in that moment when we become aware of the less than, may we see the vision of the equal. O oh, good and gracious God, give us a confidence found within your grace in the gospel to reach out and to be that so that others might delight in your way. O oh, good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the life of Margot Hamilton. We give you thanks for the life of Rose Pennard. O oh, good and gracious God, we pray for their families as they go through a process of grieving for their losses good and gracious God, may your will be that they may come to know you more clearly through their grief, through the care of those who care for them, whether it be in body or in mind or in spirit. We have prayers of healing for Charles Moore, Mariette Hamilton, Joanne Hensel, Maria Sanders. You are the great physician. No healing can take place unless you will it. So be with those who care for these names that we lift up, both as I speak in the quietness of our hearts. Be present with them and those who care for them. Oh, good and gracious God, we pray for the people of Minneapolis and to the family of George Floyd. As we begin a process of healing a broken community, may a light that shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome, guide us in that challenge of forgiveness and reconciliation. We pray for those who've died due to senseless gun violence. We pray for the, our nation as we deal with the aftermaths of the riots, both in Minneapolis and throughout the nation. We pray for the nation on how we can come together, not only for racial reconciliation, but systemic justice that affirms each of us is a child of God who deserves to love and to be loved, no matter our gender, our age, our race, our ability, our creed, or our social status. O oh, 
good and gracious God, we pray for the families of those 491,000 people who have passed away due to coronavirus. We see a number, yet you know the names behind that number. You know the grieving more than we will ever begin to imagine. O oh, good and gracious God, be there for them. Give them a sense of your loving care. O oh, good and gracious God, we pray for our churches as we continue to worship apart, yet we are gathered together in your body. Be with us that we might feel your presence with us. O oh, good and gracious God, we pray the prayer your Son taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Now is the time in our service when we receive the offering, an opportunity for stewardship and mission. If First Christian is your church home, we encourage you to continue your tithes and offerings during this season. In so many ways, the work of First Christian St. Paul is more important than ever before as we continue to be a presence in our neighborhood and online. You can give online by going to FCC stpaul.org slash give. If you would like to mail an offering by check, you can mail it to First Christian Church of St. Paul, 650 Wildwood Road, Matamidi, Minnesota, 55115. Let us give joyfully to God. To you, O oh Lord, we bring our gifts. We bring our gifts. Help us to be good stewards of all that you have given us. Please take these offerings and use them in your service. We ask this through Jesus Christ. Amen. As we come towards the end of worship, we come to a time when normally we would have communion. We are not having communion as often as we use, usually have for a lot of different reasons. So in its place, we have something called spiritual communion. This is something, a practice that we are borrowing from our of, um, Anglican and Catholic friends. And it's a way of acknowledging that we want to have communion together, but for whatever reason we cannot. So we will say that and then we will finish with the benediction. Dear Jesus, we believe that you are truly present in the Lord's Supper. We love you above all things and we desire to possess you within our souls. And since we, can, and since we cannot now receive you sacramentally, we beseech you to come spiritually into our hearts. We unite ourselves to you, together with all your faithful people, gathered around every table of your church, and we embrace you with all the affection of our souls. Never permit us to be separated from you. Amen. Before we um, end with worship, just a reminder, um, we will be having our coffee hour. If you are watching this um, live at 10 a.m., we will be having that uh, right after this at 11 
and that you can um, join us by finding and we will have the um, web address on Zoom so that you can get on to the Zoom session to join us and we'd love to have you take part. With that, let us say the benediction. Do not ever be afraid to welcome others. Bring your welcoming, accepting spirit to all those whom you meet. May God go with you on your journey this week and all of your days. And all God's people say, Amen. Go in peace, dear friends, to love and to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Take My Life and Let It Be, originally a hymn written by Francis Ridley Havergal in 1874. This text has been written into many different languages and many different tunes. It is a hymn of consecration. Uh, she said, I committed my soul to the Savior, and earth and heaven seemed brighter from that moment. It is a commitment to our Savior. And this particular version is um, made it into the ELW, was written uh, by composer Bill Dexheimer Ferris, who lived and worked in El Salvador and fell in love with their culture and people and music that he wrote it in um, Latin American music style. Take my voice and let me sing.